So let's jump in and whomever is uh, controlling the slides, if you could jump to slide two where at the beginning or at the top, it says client at a glance. So guys, we're gonna jump right in. A little bit of background. Uh, this is a proprietary assessment owned by FranNet. It has been uh, tested to have 95% accuracy. Like many other online profiles, as you may be familiar with the DISC profile or the Myers-Briggs profile, uh, this does a lot of the similar measurements. Uh, and you know, if there's talking in the background, if you could please mute your lines, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Uh, similar to many other assessments, uh, this test assessment identifies core competencies, leadership style, management style. Uh, the differentiator, in my opinion and in my experience, is that this assessment also measures values. And what makes that so important for me is I know that when my actions, whether in my personal life or my professional life, align with my values, I tend to be more efficient, more fulfilled, more engaged, more satisfied, and ultimately more successful. What we've also realized over the years is that certain types of driving values also enhance performance in certain types of positions and industries. So I'm gonna provide some insights into that today as well. So if you turn to page two of your profile results, there's just a couple of things I wanna call out is there's often a little bit of confusion on the word compliance, which you'll see at the top of page two. So compliance in this case has to do with someone's willingness and ability to follow systems. Most people profile as average in compliance. So if you are an overachiever and you're used to profiling really high in things and you profile as average, it's just fine. Uh, really what we're looking at here is, is while most people profile as average, what that indicates is that you can probably follow the rules, follow procedures when they make sense, and yet you probably have the capacity to do some creative problem solving when needed. Here's the thing, if you profile as low in compliance, usually that's an indicator of someone who likes to recreate the wheel, have an extreme amount of autonomy and self-direction in their work in a, on a daily basis. Now, somebody who profiles as high or even very high in compliance in my experience, these people usually have a background in a pretty regulated industry like finance, operations, education, veterans often profile as very high in compliance. So if you profile as high in compliance, what I'm looking for for you is that your career, whatever position or even a, a business that you own, that you are supported with processes and procedures and or empowered into creating these, these processes and procedures. Usually someone who's high in compliance tends to feel a little bit more safe and they perform better in something that's slightly more regulated, whereas someone who is low in compliance, these same systems may feel suffocating. So it's not that any one is better than another, it's really what is best for you as an individual. I will also say this, that usually someone who scores as high in compliance, they usually have uh, a very low tolerance for poor systems, poor procedures, and are usually gifted at innovating them. Uh, the other thing on this page that I'd like to call out toward the bottom is sales potential. If you're anything like me, you may hear the word sales and think of a cheesy used car salesman. And that's actually the complete opposite of what we're talking about. So sales potential in this case, what we're really looking at is someone's customer acquisition abilities. So as we progress in our career and whether we manage accounts or maybe we are responsible for winning new accounts, or if you're a business owner, customer acquisition is key to the success of your business. Usually people who are high in sales potential 
usually prefer being out and about in the community, are very good at initiating and creating relationships. Whereas someone who is low or average in sales potential, they usually prefer working in their place of business. And once the customer or the client comes to you, you tend to be gifted in really taking care of them. So to oversimplify, if we were to look at the world in terms of hunters and gatherers, hunters are, are the sales potential people who tend to be high. And gatherers are the people who tend to be on the lower end of the, the, the spectrum. Uh, let's jump to the next slide, if you will, slide three, because we're really going to get into, uh, well, actually not slide three, sorry, we are going to jump down to slide five for values and motives. We're really going to jump, thank you, perfect, we're really going to jump into the meat of, of this assessment. So. Values and motives, if we really want to know how someone is going to perform, we find out what they value, what motivates them. And if you look on this page, on your profile, you will have uh, two words. They will be any two of these four words. It'll be achiever, belonger, societal, and emulator. And if you see here, there's ones that's going to be listed first, that's your dominant. The example that we're showing here, this person profiles as an achiever belonger. So look and see what you profile on on this page. So looking at this page, uh, if you have belonger as your dominant, meaning that's so it's listed first. And then when I say dominant, this is about 65 to 70% of how we show up in the world. And I'd like to give you some characteristics uh, some of the advantages and disadvantages of each of these profiles. So let's start with belonger. If you profile as belonger, what I have witnessed in the past is belongers tend to be the most responsible, loyal, reliable, trustworthy people walking the planet. Belongers tend to put family and close friendships of the utmost priority. Uh, belongers are gifted at putting other people at ease. Uh, if you're a belonger, you know, you may have people you barely know disclosing a lot of personal information about themselves just because they sense your trustworthiness and you have a way of helping people feel more comfortable. It's not that everybody else is shallow. But if you profile as belonger, I mean, you take this ability to connect with people on a whole new level. And keep in mind, we're not talking about introverts and extroverts. We're talking about values. So the good news about being a belonger is, I mean, all those qualities I just said are amazing. Your ability to connect with people and establish meaningful relationships. Another advantage of being a belonger is that you are really gifted at talking to people about sensitive information. So an example I like to use is, is there's a business I work with, uh, it's a tutoring business where people sit down with parents in their homes and they have a really meaningful conversation about maybe if their child has some uh, special needs in education. And you can see how that could be a sensitive subject. And a belonger is someone who's uniquely qualified to really connect with people and talk about something that could be sensitive. The downside with being a belonger is that not everybody is a belonger. And you probably don't need me to tell you this, but what that looks like is that not everyone can mirror back to you the loyalty and responsibility and trustworthiness that you bring to the table and that you bring to your relationships. That's the good news, bad news about being a belonger. In terms of work, career, or business ownership, uh, again, I would like to see a belonger working in an environment where their ability to connect with people is really uh, is an asset for what they do. Now, belongers, I, for a belonger, I don't want to see you rushed. I don't want to see you in a position or at a company that is highly transactional and fast paced because belongers tend to feel disconnected in this type of fast paced environment. And when they're disconnected, their performance tends to go down. So I want you to feel connected. 
I want you to have time and space to connect with people, whether that's your clients or your colleagues, so that you can feel safe and really perform at your best. Okay, next, let's talk about achievers. So, if achiever is your dominant, or, and by the way, any of these I'm speaking to, they could be your secondary, um, which is pretty self-explanatory, but achiever, if achiever is your dominant, well, I'm pretty impressed that you even bothered to take the profile. Only 14% of the population profiles as achiever as their dominant trait. And it's pretty self-explanatory. Achievers like to achieve. Achievers like to attain. Achievers are goal-oriented. They like to win. Achievers tend to perform best when they are in control. And I don't mean controlling over others, just in control of yourself, your schedule, your environment, what you're spending your time and your energy on. When I work with an achiever, I just wanna make sure you're pointed in the right direction and I wanna get out of your way because you know what it takes to get results. And really, let's face it, achievers really like to win and they usually do. So with achievers, you, I'd like to thank you for your patience because I'm probably using a lot of words for you as you ultimately like to get to the bottom line. The only downside with being an achiever, let's face it, only 14% of the population is an achiever. And what I typically hear from achievers is uh, somewhat of a challenge with their employees. Because achievers, we like to think that other people are just as motivated and just as goal-oriented as we are. And what I hear from achievers is, I don't wanna micromanage anybody, but I'm here if they have any questions, I just want them to do their work. Statistically, they're probably not gonna perform the way you do, and that can be a challenge for achievers with employees and colleagues. So just bear in mind, achievers, that you have a drive unlike most people. Be patient with everyone else as they're trying to keep up. Next, let's talk about societal. So societal, think societally conscious. Societals are people who feel called to make a difference, to have an impact. Societals are people who like to work for a company organization where there's honor that is very noble. Uh, societals tend to be information seekers. So societals tend to be highly educated or highly intelligent. And if there is a topic that interests a societal, a societal often just seeks mastery. They just seek information and knowledge around that topic. Uh, societals, because they are such information seekers, I like to see a societal working in a slower paced environment where they have time to access information, to make a well-informed decision. Societals tend to fear manipulation. So they like to know, they like to be aware, they like to understand. And societals kind of hold the bottom line for everyone else because societals are highly principled, have high integrity, impeccable standards, both of themselves and any organization that they like to be affiliated with. So if you're a societal, you'll probably spend, you know, if you had 30 minutes to kill online, a societal will probably be reading up on current events, what's going on in our community, in our country. They're a lot less likely to be on Facebook. And thank you for showing some of those statistics there. Um, so let's jump to emulator. Emulator, if you have emulator in your profile, emulators are people who see things through a lens of possibility and potential. Emulators seek continuous improvement. Good is good, but good is not good enough. So whereas the other, the other profiles, we tend to see a job well done, an emulator sees how and where it could be better. And they tend to overextend themselves why? Because an emulator sees possibility or potential for greatness in an initiative, in a project, in a concept, and then they want to run with it. But then an emulator will see possibility for greatness in another project, and they'll want to run with that. So good news, bad news about emulators. Emulators can take things to new heights 
new possibilities. They can make things shinier and prettier and deeper and wider than anybody else. But emulators need constant change, constant challenge, mental stimulation, because emulators can get bored easily. And when an emulator gets bored, they are no longer productive. They have kind of lost their impact. Uh, so good news, bad news is emulators can take things to new heights, but the downside is an emulator can start a lot of projects and leave them unfinished. And uh, yeah, and an emulator can get really excited about things and then they lose interest quickly. So of all the four different um, profiles, emulators like immediate gratification and they tend to make decisions the fastest. So if you recall, belongers and societals tend to work a little bit more methodically in a slower environment. Achievers tend to do well in a fast paced environment. Emulators tend to work the fastest. So let's stop there for a second. Uh, I would like to give some examples of, of further examples of businesses and industries where each of these types of values can do really well. So I already gave an example for belongers. For an achiever, achiever, you can do well in just about any business or any industry, provided you are not being micromanaged and provided you are not getting second best to work with. You're not getting the hand-me-downs of someone else. So with an achiever, I want to give them the best project, the best territory, the things with the most potential because an achiever knows how to get results out of it. For societal, societals tend to feel called to industries like nonprofits, education, anything helping children, senior care, uh, renewable energy, sustainable living. These are all great examples of industries where you can really feel a difference, feel like you're making a difference. And for an emulator, I would like to see you in a position, again, with constant change, constant challenge, lots of stimulation, uh, something where you can get projects and initiatives started, and then really, let's face it, maybe hand it off to a belonger, an achiever, or a societal, and then go start something else. Yeah, yeah, great question. So, Dave, I wouldn't say there are any specific industries for belongers, but more of a position or a role where you get to connect with people. So actually, I can give you some examples. So uh, I do, I place a, a lot of people in kind of health and fitness or health and wellness. And you can see how this might be a position where you're working one on one with people around their health, mental, physical, psychological health and overall well being. Uh, that's an example of something where, uh, where you really get to connect with people and, you know, let's face it, you end up kind of creating some more intimate relationships and really getting a holistic perspective on their life as a whole. Uh, working with families, anything working with families, because belongers tend to be gifted with, you know, working with really sensitive information. Um, I've also seen belongers really get that need fulfilled by working in a great, as part of a great team, a team environment. So even if you're not connecting with clients or external customers, but if you have an internal team where you feel really connected with your colleagues, that can also do really, really well. I know, I, I know that sounds really vague, but for belongers, it's just not as specific as it is for, for example, societal. Any other questions? Okay, well, I would like to use a little example here. So, so what happens in the workplace when we've got people with different values working together? So, for example, imagine it is Monday morning at the office and you've got a belonger and an achiever. You know, and a, and a belonger says, hey, you know, how was your weekend? And the achiever says, oh, it was good. It was good. Thanks. And the achiever asks the belonger, how was your weekend? 
And the blonde was, oh, it was great. You know, my cousin came into town and we went shopping. And then I went to go get some dog food and there was a cat adoption thing. So I got some kittens and I didn't sleep last night, you know. So an achiever, they're kind of bottom line. They're friendly. How was your weekend? And that's typically where they're coming from. Now, a belonger is usually coming from a place of, hey, I spend all this time with you at the office. I would love to get to know you better. You know, so the belonger sharing their weekend, then the achiever says, okay, great. Uh, did you get to those reports last Friday? You know, and the belonger's thinking, well, you look, you sound like a jerk. You don't even care. I just told you about my weekend. You know, you asked and I told you about it. And the achiever is looking at the belonger thinking, man, you're really scattered. You're distracted. You're all over the place. And it's not like one is right or wrong. It's just what we all come from very, very different places. If you have a societal and an emulator interacting, a societal wants information and an emulator wants to dwell in possibility. So an emulator might say, I have an idea for a new initiative and here's what we're gonna do and it's gonna be great. And a societal is saying, well, what data do you have to prove that this is good and a good idea. Like what statistics can you show me that this is gonna be impactful? And an emulator's like, I just know, and I'm excited and let's try it because I have a gift for seeing opportunities for greatness. And a societal is going, you're irresponsible. <laughs> you can kind of see how they can go back and forth. To an emulator, a societal is probably gonna be like a joy kill. And to a societal, an emulator might seem, you know, scattered and selfish. So again, it's not like there's any one that's better than the others. It's really just identifying who are you and where do you best fit. Any questions before we move on? Okay, so let's jump all the way down to um, slide 18, if you will. So I'd like to talk about work styles. And, and I'll tell you, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this because it's pretty self-explanatory and your results can give you some pretty clear indications. So a couple of things, work style, if your work style is a director, directors tend to be people who do work best when they're in charge, tend to be pretty decisive, think on their feet, are confident in their decision-making. Uh, directors tend to, I think I said this, but they tend to work best when they're in control. Uh, and when you make a decision and it turns out it's going the wrong direction, a director is the type of person that can change directions quickly and move on. A lot of achievers profile as having a director work style. Now, if you can advance to promoter, the next slide, promoters are people, and that's pretty self-explanatory, but know how to promote, how to promote others, how to promote an idea, how to promote an initiative. Uh, promoters are, tend to be people who, they're the ones that you remember when they're long gone. Now, oftentimes, emulators have a work style of either director or promoter. So let's go to collaborator. Collaborator are people whose work style, you know, this is a really somebody who's a team player, who is really gifted at, you know, letting your other colleagues and coworkers, they tend to feel really seen and heard working with a collaborator. A collaborator tends to work best when they can bounce ideas around with other people and be part of something bigger than themselves. Also, if anybody is going to get consensus out of a team, it's going to be a collaborator, somebody with a collaborator work style. And most of the time, belongers are people with a collaborative work style like this. Now, thinkers, I don't come across as many people with a thinker work style. If your work style is thinker, thinkers tend to be people whose work is very concise, extremely accurate. Like you'll never have to ask them to do something a second time. They get it done, they get it done beautifully, they do it right the first time. However, thinkers are people who, when they work, they tend to need time and space to really focus and do their work so that they can provide something that is very, very accurate. Uh, in my experience, usually belongers and societals are those with the thinker work style. 
So any questions on that? Okay. So let's jump down to slide 23, and we're going to talk about metaprograms all the way down to slide 23. Now, for those of you who have your, your profile, your 11-page report, this is page 10. And this is information that is so easily overlooked and has made such a difference in myself, in my work relationships, my personal relationships, now that I have a better understanding of metaprograms. So we all have natural inherent filters through which we process information. And the reason why this is so important to me is once I understand how I or others best process information, I can give them information in their first language, if you will, to make the most efficient use of their time and to really support them in effective decision making. So let's jump down to page, um, excuse me, slide 25. Toward the top under direction source. Most people, you're either a toward or an away. And if your profile is balanced, please listen to both toward and away. So toward people. Toward people are people who make a decision based on, hey, what can I get from this? What's possible? What are the goodies I can get? So if I show up for the PDX Mindshare webcast, and if they get started 10 or 15 minutes late, I'm still going to stick around because I really want to get this information and I think it could make a huge difference in my life. Okay, so it's like, where can we go with this? Now, next slide, away people. Away people are people who process information through a lens of, well, what could go wrong? What obstacles are we going to have to face? What challenges? You know, so I, I, you know, I jokingly refer to this, the world of Eeyores and Tiggers. Now, I am a toward person, and the, my, the funniest, it's so silly, but it's the, it's the truest example. You know, when my husband and I went to buy a blender one time, and why it's a big deal is because we burned through two blenders, and our coffee pot had caught fire on my kitchen counter. So just a typical household appliance was suddenly a major purchase in my house. So we go look at blenders. And I see this Vitamix, and I'm a toward person, so I'm looking, oh my gosh, look at this blender. This is amazing. It's also a food processor. It can crush ice. You know, it's got these buttons. It's got its own recipe book. I can teach my son. My son knows how to press buttons, so he can make recipes. You know, I'm thinking of all the great things that this blender can bring to my family, right? Now, my husband looks at the blender. And he looks at the seal where the plastic meets the carafe on the blender, and he points to it and says, this is where it's going to leak. First thing he says. So I love that example because, you know, I am a toward person. I make decisions based on, you know, what can I get from this? My husband's an away person, so he makes decisions on, you know, what kind of headaches, what could go wrong and how can we avoid the pain, okay? You jump to, oh, and pay, the next slide, if you profile as balanced, well, congratulations, only 20% of the population profiles as balanced, which means that you are simultaneously able to balance where are we going, what, can, what is possible through this, and what obstacles might we encounter? So congratulations to you. I'm a little jealous if you profile as balanced. Now, in the next slide, we're going to talk about frame of reference. And we are either internal or external. So if you could jump to slide 29, let's talk about external people. External people process information externally. So external people like to reason things out. They tend to like dialogue. External people tend to make great managers because they are not only very generous with feedback and critique, but they really welcome feedback and critique and have this two-way communication channel with other people. So, <laughs> excuse me, the down, so the good thing about external people is they, they're receptive to other people, they give great feedback, the, and they really make decisions based on fact. External people weigh in other people's opinions. 
downside about being external, and you know, and I say this, this is kind of silly, I'll use a silly example, but you know, let's say someone's thinking about making a business investment. And, you know, they're, they're talking to every Tom, Dick, and Harry about business, and they might hear some bad stories about people who really have no firsthand knowledge or experience, and that completely ambushes them from achieving their dreams. So if you profile as external and you're getting a lot of opinions, I invite you to consider the credibility and the experience of your resources, resources and make sure that they are really credible, um, credible resource for you. Now, I see the, the analogy I like to use with externals is, you know, communication is like a, play, a game of ping pong where you kind of hit the ball back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Now, the opposite of external, if you'll go to the next slide, is an internal. Internals are people who process information internally. In the, in the privacy of their own mind. So internal people, I like to use the analogy of a batting cage. You know, so if externals are playing ping pong and let's say the ball is the information, internals are in a batting cage. And if the ball comes at them in the privacy of their own mind and all alone, they're, they're weighing the ball as it comes, the velocity, the arc, what they need to do, and when they make a decision, they hit it. And they really generally don't ask for other people's opinions, you know? An internal person may have just a few people uh, that they really like and respect where they may seek counsel, but for the most part, uh, internals don't really want other people's advice or other people's information because they're really confident in their own decision-making abilities. So what happens when you have an internal and an external working together is an in external might say, hey, are you going to the PDX, PDX Mindshare webcast later? You know, and the internal's like, I don't know. Well, I'm gonna go because I wanna hear about my profile and I think it's gonna be great. I'm a belonger achiever, what are you? You know, and an internal, huh. So when they're in this interaction, the internal is looking at the external like, wow, you're really wishy-washy and you're talking to everybody about getting everybody's opinion and you're not really decisive. And the external is looking at the internal like, I'm trying to engage with you, I'm trying to collaborate with you, and you're not, you're like, it's like talking to a door. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's just something to be aware of. Again, it's not that one is better than another, but once we have more awareness of the ways that we process information, we can have a little bit more acceptance around others, and we also have choice. You know, if I am external and my husband is internal, you know, maybe that means he needs a little bit more space and privacy when we are trying to make a big decision, or vice versa. If I'm an internal and I'm married to an external, maybe I can support them by just sharing a little bit more information than I usually would. Okay, thank you so much. So let's jump down to slide 31, where we're gonna talk about task attitude, and people are either optional or procedural. And this is pretty self-explanatory, so just real quickly on the next slide, optional people are people who like to have options. So oftentimes, uh, you know, if you're an optional person, and let's say you start a new position, and there's somebody tells you, you know, this is how we do things, this is how we manage projects, this is how we operate, an optional person will probably look and listen, and in the back of their mind, they might be thinking, well, have you ever tried this way? Or could I do it another way? Is there a better way? So an optional is always kind of looking for another angle and likes to make sure that they have left no stone unturned before they make a decision. So the good news, bad news, optional people leave no stone unturned. Bad news is it can take optional people a really long time to make a decision because they wanna look at everything. Next slide talks about procedurals. Procedurals are people who say, I don't need to look at everything under the sun. Just give me a couple of the best choices and I'll make a decision and I'll move forward. So I just wanna make sure I do it right. Don't need to look at everything, make a decision, move forward, one and done kind of thing. 
and then uh, almost in so chunk size on page, uh, excuse me, slide 34, uh, people tend to be either global or specific. And global people process information best when they have context, when you can see the big picture. Um, what is the end result? What is the big goal? Okay, now I can figure out the best strategy to get there. And with a global person, so let's say, you know, you try one strategy and it doesn't go the way you thought, a global person doesn't lose sight of the overall vision or the overall goal. They'll change their strategy. Now, a specific person needs to know the details. What do I have to work with right here, right now, to get and me like, where I want to go? And, like, can you repeat that last sentence? Yeah, a specific person tends to process information best when they have all the details. What do I have to work with right here, right now, to get me where I want to go? So a simple example I like to use is if you are giving directions. So if I said, okay, where is the nearest, um, where is the nearest Whole Foods? A global person is more likely to say, well, it's on the west side of town. And if you take the Burnside Bridge, blah, 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 blah. And you know it's how a global person usually starts big picture context, then tells me how to get there. Now, a specific person, if I say, where is the nearest Whole Foods? A specific person is more likely to say, okay, when you pull out of the parking lot, take your first right. You're going to go two blocks, and then you're going to take a left. And they're leading with specifics. So I'm going to talk about the last um, meta program here, and then we'll have a couple of times for uh, a couple of minutes for question. I respect your time. I still want to get you done here at noon. So we're going to talk about communication style. And if you can jump down to slide 37, so there's auditory, visual, and kinesthetic. Now, or excuse me, slide 36. I was wrong. Let's start with auditory. So auditory people tend to be very articulate, very succinct. Uh, auditory people tend to use fewer words. They tend to be very good writers. And it's funny because most of the time when I tell an auditory person that, um, they disagree with me. Because when I say you're a great writer, it's not necessarily like you're a great novelist, but you probably know how to articulately make your point, you know, in an email, let's say, and then move on. Auditory people, you're great listeners, and they never repeat themselves. They don't have to because they said what they meant, and they said it well, and they said it once, and they're done. And if other people listened as well as auditory people, they wouldn't have to repeat themselves. Visual people, now this is slide 37, visual people tend to paint pictures with words. They tend to be very detailed. They tend to speak a little quicker, a little bit higher pitched, and they just use a lot of words. Now, visual people are great writers, more in the sense of writing a novel. You know, they could write about the setting and the plot, and they could give great character descriptions, okay? Um, and then finally, we have kinesthetic. Now, kinesthetic communicators are people who communicate best based on experience. Now, some people think kinesthetic means emotional. What I believe is kinesthetic means experience and relying on multiple senses. So a kinesthetic person is going to absorb information best if they can see the person they're speaking with, if they can hear them clearing, clearly, if maybe they're reading the report that they're discussing. And also for a kinesthetic person, just the energy of the people that you're communicating with. So a kinesthetic person might be kind of struggling on this webcast right now because you can't see me. And, you know, is this presenter friendly? Is she distracted? Is she cold? Is she you know, talking with her hands, like these are all things that helps a kinesthetic absorb information. And this is another great example when you have people with different communication styles. An auditory person, bless your heart, you're probably going to need a lot of patience when speaking with a visual person. A visual person, you are probably going to 
not get as much feedback from an auditory person as you were from others. So these are just great examples. And again, Emily, if you can hear me, you're cutting out again. Oh, weird. Okay. So different people just have different communication styles. So knowing your communication style and then maybe having some either patience or adaptability uh, with other people's communication styles. So I want to stop there. We've got a couple of minutes left and I want to be sure I can address any questions people have. Mm, yeah, that was, that, then, you know, is, if Dave is still on the line, that is something that Paris and I kind of talked about. It's like, okay, so I don't want to be misleading because this can help people identify certain types of positions and industries that are best suited for them. Um, but let's face it, I mean, if we're looking at a job search or we're job searching online, a lot of that information isn't available to you at a glance. So um, my hope is that you can use this information from your profile in your networking. And also, I have had a number of people tell me that uh, for their resume, they literally copy and paste information um, from their values and from their meta programs. They literally copy and paste that information onto their resume and it gives them some insights to speak with confidence about themselves in interviewing. So Dave, I'm happy to connect with you one-on-one -on -one to explore that further if helpful. All right, <laughs> thanks everybody. Have a great day.